Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We know that uh, Monday night programs are always tough. Happy to see so many good friends in the audience tonight. Uh, the launch of an HRNK report is always a very special event. Um, of course, we, we do have a lot of outreach activities, but truly the, the very essence of our work is our research, our reports, and um, we are delighted to have this uh, opportunity to be launching um, another HRNK report that is likely to receive a lot of attention, and uh, that will hopefully, to a certain extent, who knows, at some, st at some stage, uh, change the course of history. I am Greg Scarlatiu, Executive Director of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, and it is an extraordinary privilege to introduce the first speaker of the night, who is going to give welcoming remarks on behalf of HRNK's board. Uh, Mrs. Suzanne Scholte is co-vice chair of the board at HRNK and also a chairperson of the North Korea Freedom Coalition and president of the Defense Forum Foundation. Um, Suzanne is a great personal friend and mentor. Uh, this is an extraordinarily busy week for her, and we're so happy that she's here. We're so happy that um, several members of her delegation have joined her, including our good friend, Mr. Kim Song-min. Um, I am uh, very glad to know that um, in addition to the three board members who will be up on stage, Mrs. Helen Louise Hunter, uh, member of HRNK's board, is also here tonight. Suzanne Scholte is um, president of the Defense Forum Foundation, uh, a, uh, an educational foundation that sponsors programs on national security, foreign affairs, and human rights issues. Suzanne is very well known for being a true leader of the North Korean human rights movement. She was the first one to bring North Korean defectors to Washington, D.C. to testify before Congress. Since 1996, the Defense Forum Foundation has hosted over 57 defectors, including North Korea's highest defector ever, Mr. Hwang Jang-yop, who passed away in uh, late 2010. Um, Suzanne continues to work very closely with um, members of Congress on North Korean human rights issues, and uh, she uh, continues to play an extraordinarily important role in ensuring that the momentum of the North Korean human rights movement continues to move forward. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Suzanne Scholte and to give her the floor, Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Greg. On behalf of the HRNK Board of Directors, I thank, um, thank all of you for being here tonight, on a Monday night, and uh, for those who, especially those who travel from South Korea to be here. Um, and on behalf of the board, I want to thank Josh Stanton. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, I haven't seen you in a while. Good to see you. <laughs> on, on behalf of uh, the board, I also want to thank Josh Stanton, just an incredible, brilliant, brilliant um, young man who took time out of his busy schedule to help prepare this report. Um, his critical analysis and his hard work on this issue for many, many years has just been a real inspiration to all of us. And I know that we, we do greatly benefited from some talking points recently on, on the, uh, is, some of the issues that, you, that you've helped on. But um, it, with his blog, One Free Korea, it's, it's, it's outstanding uh, writing and analysis on North Korea. So it's wonderful and to be here, but it's an honor to especially with this report coming up. And I'm very grateful for HRNK, particularly Greg, for scheduling this during North Korea Freedom Week because we've always had a very strong partnership and involvement with HRNK with this uh, event that we've been doing every year since 2004. Um, as many of you know, HRNK is the only U.S.-based nonpartisan organization exclusively tasked with investigating and documenting and reporting on North Korea human rights violations. Uh, they were the responsible for the hidden gulag report that David Hawk prepared in 2003. And I can tell you personally, Greg uh, indicated that I had hosted the first defectors, and that is absolutely true, but I will tell you, it's actually over 100 by now. But it wasn't until that report got published that people really started to pay attention to political prison camps. 
It wasn't, and even though we'd had witnesses, even though we'd had congressional hearings on that issue, even though we brought survivors of these camps to testify in Washington, it wasn't until HRNK pulled those facts together and published the report that people really started to understand the grave gravity of the political prisoner camps. So um, I want to uh, call for you to uh, consider a couple things about HRNK to help this organization. But first of all, staying informed by visiting the hrnk.org HRNK website. All the publications are online and available there. You can also stay connected by liking it if you're into social media, um, liking it on Facebook and Twitter and other social medias. But you can also sign up for the uh, newsletter that they do with news and information um, and spread the word about HRNK and the work that they're doing. And also, it does depend on support from donors. So we, uh, we also would love to have your co continual financial support for HRNK. And I do want to, um, Greg said I, it was fine for me to mention this, but this is the 12th annual North Korea Freedom Week. And this is one of the events um, that's being sponsored. And I wanted to just let you uh, all know that we have the program and schedule for all the events of the 12th annual North Korea Freedom Week. What we're emphasizing this year is the importance of the act, activism of the defectors and the need to partner with them. There isn't a greater resource that we have than the North Korean defectors themselves that know how to get information in, know how to get information out, and also are doing an incredible and amazing work in rescuing refugees out of China, getting uh, radio broadcasting. Kim Sung Min is here, who's the co-chair of, of North Korea Freedom Week, who's the director of Free North Korea Radio, and the amazing work that they're doing with extremely limited budgets. So we're emphasizing their activism because the COI report that came out last year proved that and concluded that crimes against humanity were being committed in North Korea. So there's an awareness now of that issue that Jack Rendler started to talk about many, many years ago about North Korea, one of the first Americans to get involved in the issue. People are aware of it now. There's no denying it. And when HRNK published a report, there were still people denying that these camps existed. There's no more denying this. They're committing crimes against humanity in North Korea. But the COI report's only going to go so far. It only makes us aware. And unless we take action, there's going to be no change for the people in North Korea. So that's one of the themes of North Korea Freedom Week, and I encourage you all to, um, to look at the, uh, the schedule of events that, that are happening at nkfreedom.org, and we do have um, information on all these different events. I'd love to have you join for any of those um, events that we're having. We're doing things at the Chinese Embassy. We're going up to the UN uh, to speak at the General Assembly up there. We've got uh, Robert F. Kennedy Center's hosting a panel session. Heritage Foundation is hosting a panel session. So there's different events going on all week. So I encourage you to, to uh, look at our, the schedule of those events. We'd love to have you join in, in those as well. And again, I really want to thank uh, HRNK. It's an honor to be a co-chair and have been one of the people that helped found that organization and the great work that Greg has done in, uh, as our executive director. So thank you all for being here tonight. Well, Suzanne, thank you very much. Uh, I would also uh, like to acknowledge the presence of um, uh, His Excellency Masaharu Nakagawa, who is a member of the Japanese Diet and who has uh, just joined us tonight. Uh, it is an extraordinary privilege to have an opportunity to introduce the author of the report we are launching tonight, uh, Joshua Stanton. Uh, he's known as uh, a uh, seasoned Korea expert. He's been known as such for many years. Many of us include his blog, One Free Korea, in the core list of daily readings we have to follow in order to continue to stay informed on North Korean issues. Um, Josh uh, served uh, for four years as a U.S. Army judge advocate in the Republic of Korea, and uh, that's probably around the time when he, he started developing this extraordinary interest in Korean Peninsula issues. Um, Josh, uh, Suzanne has mentioned HRNK's work on the camps. Josh was the first one to identify and publish satellite imagery of camps 16, 25, and 12 in North Korea. 
His work has been cited in the Wall Street Journal, in the Washington Post, uh, in many other publications, um, and uh, we, uh, we are quite accustomed to seeing Josh being interviewed by uh, CNN or uh, other mainstream media organizations. He's also known for having recently assisted the Committee of Foreign, on Foreign Affairs of the House of Representatives with the drafting of the North Korea Sanctions Enforcement Act of 2014, um, then known as H.R. 1771, then uh, reintroduced as H.R. 757 on uh, the 5th of February 2015, um, a story that has not yet been written in Josh's bio is that it's an extraordinary pleasure to work with him. And our entire team is aware of that. He has been extraordinarily responsive to internal, external reviewers, staff members. Uh, we, we, we've really enjoyed working with him and we really look forward to continuing this relationship. It is very important that I mention that the views Mr. Stanton will express tonight are his own and do not represent the views of the Foreign Affairs Committee or of any organization or government agency. Certainly, HRNK stands by Josh's report and his findings. This report is the result of a very thorough review by HRNK's board and staff. That said, Josh, please, uh, we look forward to your keynote presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, so much for those kind words, and thank you, Suzanne, and I'm among many friends. Uh, thank you for coming out on an evening and accommodating my work schedule being here now. And uh, I would first like to just ask uh, Raymond Ha and uh, Rosa Park, are you in the audience? Would you please stand up? I would, is, is Raymond not here? Okay, well, I wanted to thank Raymond and Rosa for all that they have done to site check everything to get the footnotes into proper shape. I am a millennial, so I believe that footnotes are sort of a fossil of the 70s. I like hyperlinks. Thank you so much for getting this into the proper format and all you have done behind the scenes. Thank you. On January 16, 2000, the Reverend Kim Dong-shik had been in Northeast China for approximately 10 years helping North Korean refugees, including children, who had fled from oppression and from famine in their homeland. Uh, Reverend Kim was a lawful permanent resident of the United States, and he had left behind a wife and children in Skokie, Illinois. Uh, he was not a well man. He was approximately 60 years old and he was confined to a wheelchair. Uh, on the night of uh, January 16, 2000, he had had an appointment in a restaurant. And he walked out of the restaurant, and he stepped out onto the sidewalk, and then a car pulled up, a taxi, and the door opened, and a group of men appeared, and they pushed him into the back of the car, closed the door, and drove away. When they did this, they took away his cell phone, and his money, and his family never heard from him again. Now, Reverend Kim knew that when he went to the city of Yanji in northeastern China, that there were many dangers that he faced there, because the people that Reverend Kim was helping in North Korea were refugees who were themselves in grave danger of being taken away by North Korean abduction squads. Those squads were uh, organizations, okay, those squads answered to the Reconnaissance General Bureau, North Korea's external spy agency, and with most likely the full knowledge and assent of the Chinese government, they have been abducting refugees in China and hauling them back across the North Korean border to gulags or to worse for many years. Perhaps the Reverend Kim thought that his status as an American resident would protect him, and perhaps he was simply so brave that his courage overcame his fear. But it took four agonizing years for Reverend Kim's family to find out what had happened to their father 
and their husband. And what happened was that in that year, 2004, in Seoul, the South Korean authorities arrested a man named Yu Yong Hwa. Yu had been sent by his masters in Pyongyang to a new assignment inside South Korea. And there in South Korea, he was arrested. And under questioning, he admitted that he, in fact, was a member of the abduction squad that had kidnapped Reverend Kim. Mr. Yu was convicted of the crime. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. And I would add that that was almost exactly 10 years ago today. So he should have gotten out of prison recently. Uh, nonetheless, Reverend Kim's case has never been mentioned in any of the State Department reporting on North Korea's state sponsorship of terrorism, whether before or after North Korea's removal from the list on October 11, 2008. His case was, for a time, of great importance to members of Congress. And in early 2005, every single member of the Illinois congressional delegation signed a letter to Pak gil Yon, the North Korean ambassador to the United Nations, saying that they would not support North Korea's removal from the list of state sponsors of terrorism until the North Korean government accounted for Reverend Kim's fate. Now, the North Korean government never has accounted for Reverend Kim's fate, although under interrogation, Mr. Yu said that Reverend Kim was driven to a military base near Pyongyang where he was tortured and starved. His weight dropped from 180 pounds to 75 pounds, and he died and was buried in a restricted area there in North Korea. Um, so it took us all this time to find out. And in the meantime, the entire Illinois congressional delegation wrote this letter. Uh, this letter came from some of the most powerful politicians in America. Dennis Hastert, then the Speaker of the House, and Henry Hyde, who passed away not long after that, the Chairman of the House International Relations Committee. Uh, Rahm Emanuel, you may have heard, is now the Mayor of Chicago. And uh, Dick Durbin, the senior senator from Illinois, and one other name, the junior senator from Illinois, a man you may have heard of named Barack Obama. All of these men signed this letter and made this commitment, and yet it was three years from that time that President Bush announced that he would remove North Korea from the list of state sponsors of terrorism, uh, in violation, by the way, of a commitment that President Bush had made to the mother of a Japanese abductee, uh, the, uh, a young woman, a 13-year-old girl named Megumi Yakota. So we see, really, that there is a bipartisan loss of credibility uh, and candor when it comes to the removal of North Korea from this list. And there was a lot of other conduct that President Bush had to overlook in the course of removing North Korea from this list. Uh, North Korea, uh, there are two certifications uh, in the Export Administration Act. Uh, you will see that I've cited in the report that the president has to make to remove uh, a state from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. First, that the country has not provided any support for international terrorism during the preceding six-month period. And number two, that the country, in this case North Korea, has provided assurances that it will not support acts of international terrorism in the future. Now let's unpack each of those certifications. First, North Korea has not supported uh, or provided support for international terrorism during the previous six months. Well. The Bush administration had to ignore a few things in order to get to that conclusion. And first, they had to ignore the case of Reverend Kim. Uh, but at the time, and to this very day, North Korea harbors four men, members of the Japanese Red Army, uh, who were hijackers, uh, who hijacked a plane to North Korea in 1970. This conduct had been repeatedly cited by the State Department in its annual country reports on terrorism all the way up to this very day, as a matter of fact. Um, they also had to ignore uh, the intelligence reports up until that time of North Korea providing weapons and support to Hezbollah and the Tamil Tigers, and finally, the dozens of Japanese and third country citizens who are allegedly abducted by North Korea. And in fact, North Korea admitted and returned several of these abductees. 
Uh, and that is an issue that also remains unresolved to this very day. The second certification that the Bush administration had to make is that North Korea had provided assurances that it would not support acts of international terrorism in the future. Uh, but contrary to North Korea's uh, assurances at the time, there has in fact been a sharp increase in North Korea's sponsorship of terrorism that falls into several categories. This is, of course, the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. So for many of us here, the issue that is closest to our heart is North Korea's attacks against and intimidation of the people who have fled North Korea to South Korea. And in fact, what we have seen is that a campaign of abductions has morphed into a campaign of assassinations and attempted assassinations of North Korean defectors, of South Korean activists in China the report documents multiple cases of this, attempts uh, that have resulted in criminal convictions in, in some cases to assassinate people uh, like Hwang jong yeop uh, that Greg referred to previously, uh, people like uh, Pak sung hak the activist uh, that, of course, launches the balloons across the DMZ. Uh, not all of these attempts, by the way, have been unsuccessful. Uh, a gentleman named Kim chang Hwan. Uh, according to the South Korean investigators who looked into this case, was in fact assassinated by North Korean agents in the city of uh, Dandong in 2011. The very next day in the city of Yanji, where Reverend Kim was kidnapped, uh, another activist who isn't named, because he may still be working there, reports that a man came up behind him, stuck a needle in his back, and walked away saying, sorry, sorry. Uh, this time the victim survived. So there is a real and serious threat, and the, the North Korean refugees who live in South Korea feel this very clearly. Uh, for those of you who have read the report of the UN Commission of Inquiry, there were, of course, hundreds of North Koreans who were interviewed. 240 of these people demanded uh, confidentiality in their interviews because they were afraid of either being targeted by the North Koreans or that their family members would suffer repercussions as a result of this. Now, by now you see that I feel that North Korea should be back on the list of state sponsors of terrorism, and I'll, I'll give you additional reasons for that. But to close the loop with Reverend Kim, I'm not, if you don't, if my word is not enough for this, take the word of three federal judges who have recently held in published opinions that North Korea has sponsored acts of terrorism. After this report went to the printer two weeks ago, a federal judge in the US District Court for the District of Columbia awarded $330 million in compensatory and punitive damages to Reverend Kim's family against the government of North Korea, finding that North Korea was responsible for his kidnapping and murder. That is the third such decision by a federal judge in uh, 2010 in the District of Puerto Rico in the case of Calderon Cardona versus DPRK, a federal judge awarded a series of plaintiffs 378 million in damages relating to North Korea's provision of weapons and training to the Japanese Red Army and the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine related to the 1972 Lode Airport Massacre, which killed 26 people including 17 Americans and injured 79 others. In a third case, Kaplan versus DPRK, uh, that case is still pending in the US District Court for the District of Columbia, a different judge, Royce Lambert, uh, one of the most respected and I would add feared judges in the federal judiciary, uh, recently held that North Korea was responsible for providing weapons and technical assistance and materials and support of rocket attacks that injured civilians in northern Israel. So the court has decided that North Korea was in fact liable in this case. The damages have not yet been apportioned. Uh, a special master is deciding that issue as we speak. So right now we have a total of $757 million in damages against North Korea by American US person plaintiffs uh, with the decision in the Kaplan case that amount could soon approach a billion dollars. Which brings us to one important consequence 
of listing a state as a sponsor of terrorism, and we will unpack all of those in a minute, because it is, of course, important to ask why any of this matters. But first, let's talk about what international terrorism means, and it's important to talk about that because the law does not make this clear. You will sometimes see the State Department saying several different things about the list of state sponsors of terrorism, including there are very specific and precise standards, and North Korea has to meet these standards in order to be uh, relisted as a state sponsor. And I'm here to tell you that I respectfully disagree with that, and for those who, uh, whose duty it is to hold the government accountable for saying these things, I would urge you to read the statutes. And I've reproduced them and I've analyzed them in the report. There is no definitive statutory definition of support or international terrorism that applies for purposes of the Export Administration Act, which is the keyhole to listing a state as a sponsor of terrorism. However, by putting together a combination of different legal authorities and precedents, you can come to some common elements and you can sort of figure out an operational definition of this. It's almost like when a lawyer takes a collection of statutes and applies some decisions that judges have made and then you can come up with the general parameters of what the law says. So, having done this, international terrorism has to be, uh, there, there are two ways to get there and I will call them the wholesale path and the retail path. The retail path, in other words, meaning that the government directly inflicts the terrorist act on the victim. The wholesale path meaning that the government actually supports a terrorist organization. That is the easier of the two. Governments that provide knowing and material support to terrorists or terrorist organizations can be listed as state sponsors. And there are so many precedents in the State Department reporting that I'm confident that no one would argue otherwise. Um, now, how is international terrorism defined? Uh, you put together all of the different statutes and you have to have five things. Uh, and this again is for terrorism that is carried out at the state's own direction. So first the act must be violent or it must be a threat uh, of a violent act or an attempt to commit a violent act. Number two, it must be against a non-combatant target. If you target uniformed military personnel on active duty, that does not meet the standard. Number three, it must be international. It must be across borders uh, or involve the citizens or nationals of one country. Four, it must be politically motivated. That is to say, the intent has to be to change policy or to intimidate or coerce a civilian population. And number five, it cannot be carried out by the government's uniform conventional armed forces. It has to be carried out either by subnational groups or clandestine agents. I began by talking about the Reconnaissance General Bureau. Nearly all of the conduct described in this report is ultimately attributable to the Reconnaissance General Bureau, whether those be abductions, whether they be assassination attempts against emigres, defectors, dissidents, or whether that be the provision of weapons to terrorist organizations. And that is my segue to talk about that. Um, in the year 2009 in particular, that was a banner year for North Korea's provision of arms to uh, what the Washington Post described as anti-Israel militant groups in the Middle East. Chiefly Hezbollah seems to be the number one customer for North Korean arms. Hezbollah has been listed as a terrorist organization by the State Department for many years. Uh, there were multiple interceptions in that year there were also some interceptions that cannot necessarily be attributed to North Korea. Uh, I didn't include them in the report unless there was some significant evidence in support of it. Uh, but beginning in July, by the way, one month after UN Security Council 1874 tightened the arms embargo against North Korea, the ANL Australia was intercepted in UAE with explosives and rocket parts. Uh, later, in the same um, summer, a merchant ship called the MV Frankop was intercepted by Israeli commandos in the eastern Mediterranean. It was carrying 500 tons of weapons, including 122 millimeter rockets. How do we know that this was headed for terrorists? Because the State Department said so. The State Department actually cited this incident as a basis for listing Syria as a state sponsor of terrorism, but never mentioned 
the fact that according to a UN panel of experts, the weapons most likely came from a North Korean source. Then in December, we saw something even more frightening when a plane load carrying 35 tons of weapons, including 240 millimeter rockets, was intercepted in Bangkok, Thailand. And what is really, truly frightening about this is that the shipment also contained manned portable surface-to-air missiles. So in the report, you will see a photograph of those missiles. They are shoulder-fired anti-aircraft missiles of Soviet or Russian manufacture capable of bringing down civilian airliners. And these were found in a plane load of arms that according to the Foreign Minister of Israel and US intelligence sources, were on the way for the use of terrorist organizations, either in whole or in part. So there is a lot here that needs to be answered for. Um, now, even more recently, we have seen reports that uh, North Korea, North Korean technical experts have been in Syria helping the Syrian government manufacture missiles, some of which are delivered to Hezbollah. <clears throat> now, in addition to these acts, I, I would allege that all of the conduct that I have described clearly meets either the wholesale or the retail definition of the state sponsorship of terrorism. There are other acts where I think it's really more debatable under the legal standards, which are, after all, vague and amorphous. Um, the proliferation of nuclear and chemical weapons technology is something that the State Department has repeatedly used to justify the inclusion of Iran and Syria and other countries as state sponsors of terrorism. But if you look at the strict legal definitions of state sponsorship, it doesn't really meet the test unless there is actual evidence of proliferation of the WMDs directly to a terrorist organization. That is an issue that our friends in Congress perhaps can clarify for us one day. Um, we have some friends in Congress who can clarify that for us one day. Um, money laundering and terrorist financing. Uh, the reports uh, in the State Department's annual country reports repeatedly cite countries whose regimes to combat money laundering and the financing of terrorism are insufficient. However, absent direct evidence that a state has actually financed uh, a transaction for a terrorist organization, such as selling weapons to Hezbollah, I think that would count, uh, that by itself is not sufficient to justify a listing. And as you note in the report, there is already another remedy in the law for exactly that problem. It's called Section 311 of the Patriot Act. Um, I'd be happy to have another discussion about why that should be applied to North Korea, but that's a subject for another day. The sinking of the rock ship Chonan uh, was uh, a close call in the sense that it was allegedly uh, carried out by the Reconnaissance General Bureau, but at the end of the day, it was carried out using conventional military means. It was an act of war, a violation of the armistice, and many other very terrible things. But as far as being an act of sponsorship of terrorism, I think it falls in the gray zone. With respect to the shelling of Yunpyeong Island several months later, that was clearly an attack by conventional military forces. I don't think it would meet the definition. The incident, of course, which has caused so many people, including the outgoing chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, to call for North Korea to be put back on the list of state sponsors of terrorism was the cyber attack against Sony Pictures. I think it's important to analyze the attack against Sony as two incidents and not one. There was the cyber attack against Sony itself and the outing of all of its embarrassing information to WikiLeaks and the press and others. And while that may be uh, something that was intended to chill and deter free expression, it does not meet the standard of a violent act. And, and that by itself would not be the basis for listing a state as a sponsor of terrorism. However, shortly after the hack, there was an accompanying threat by the same group, the so-called Guardians of Peace, saying that there would be a 9-11 style attack against movie theaters showing the interview. I think if you read the report, it shows that threats to commit violent acts clearly are classifiable and uh, are a basis to list a state as a sponsor of terrorism. If you accept my logic in the report, then the threats against the American people do meet the standard. Since then, and most recently, 
the South Korean authorities have alleged that North Korean hackers, part of the same unit, uh, are, were behind a cyber attack on multiple South Korean nuclear power plants and attempted to cause a reactor malfunction. Now, I would love to see more details about exactly what happened in that situation, but this is terrifying. And if this is what it appears to be, certainly that would meet the standard and it would justify a listing. And let's talk just briefly about attribution here. Both of these attacks are alleged to have been carried out by a group called Unit 121, which operates openly, I would add, from the Chilbosan Hotel in Shenyang, China. With the full knowledge of the government of, the, of, of China, Unit 121 answers to none other than the Reconnaissance General Bureau, North Korea's clandestine external intelligence agency. Um, uh, and this was something that hit me very closely personally, not because I thought the interview was a good movie, but because the soul of our nation, what makes us America is freedom of expression. I challenge anyone to give an example of a time when a foreign power has ever so successfully chilled freedom of speech in our free society. It wasn't only the interview that could not be shown because of North Korea's objections. There was a second movie that was actually canceled. A project that was canceled would have starred Steve Carell that, that, would, that could not be made because the studio backed out. Whatever the interests, in keeping North Korea off the list of state sponsors of terrorism, they cannot be more important than protecting our interest in being free to speak and in being free from fear in our own country, or our right to hear what the defectors and refugees in North Korea have to say to us, uh, because these are important to how we approach North Korea. There was a time not so long ago when the North Koreans made menacing comments about an, a conference not unlike this one in downtown Washington in, in the Northwest where the think tanks are. I, I shudder to imagine how much good material KCNA is going to give me by the end of the week, uh, threatening all of us here today for this report. Uh, we may have to do a new edition, Greg. Um, <laughs> look, um, I want to turn to, finally, why this matters. And I would first say, uh, the State Department has suggested that relisting North Korea would be a symbolic act. And my answer to that first is that symbolic acts do matter. They are important. And furthermore, as citizens, the truth is important to us. It is important for us to expect that when our government reports on important public policy issues, that it tell us the truth and the whole truth about the issue concerned. Um, there are also some important financial and other sanctions that accompany a relisting of a state as a sponsor of terrorism. For example, if a state is listed as a sponsor of terrorism, all transactions with that state must be licensed by the Treasury Department. That's a felony if you violate it, and there is a whole set of sanctions regulations in 31 CFR Part 596 that governs those licensing requirements. Now, against a country where there are already strong sanctions like Iran or Syria, that would be superfluous. But I, for a country like North Korea where the sanctions in fact are weak, and I want to emphasize this point very strongly, the sanctions are not strong and they are not comprehensive, this would close a very important loophole in the enforcement of sanctions by the US Treasury Department. Uh, is there one person in this audience who will ask me there are so many sanctions against North Korea. Why do we need more sanctions? Will someone please ask me that question? I've been what? I've been I. Because the sanctions we have against North Korea. Okay, so we're not going to wait for it. That's fine. Uh, you could argue, and I would argue, that our sanctions against North Korea are weaker than the sanctions we have against Belarus, Zimbabwe, or Venezuela. All of the top leaders of those three governments appear on the Treasury Department's SDN list. How many of North Korea's top officials appear on that list? This many. There are a total of somewhere around 70 total North Korean entities on the SDN list compared to hundreds for Iran and until very recently Cuba or, or Syria. 
I would, I would strongly argue, and I would get no argument here, that the sanctions that we have against North Korea are far weaker than our sanctions against Iran or, or Syria, which are broad and comprehensive. What we have against North Korea is a licensing requirement to export or to import anything, to export anything that is sensitive, and also very limited uh, what Marcus calls whack-a-mole sanctions on specific North Korean entities and individuals that are known to have been involved in proliferation. There is not an embargo or broad-based uh, financial sanctions against North Korea. And the experience of Banco Delta Asia teaches us that these sanctions can work. And the UN panel of experts has recently reminded us that North Korea is still using our financial system to launder its money and to sustain itself. Uh, there are other consequences, too. We talked about the lawsuits. Uh, there is the loss of benefits by international financial institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, and the Asian Development Bank. And finally, one other that I regret very much not putting into the report, um, it is the Securities and Exchange Commission has a little office that almost no one has heard of called the Office of Global Security Risk. And as a matter of policy, this office requires securities issuers to make public reports on any investments that they have in governments or, or, or jurisdictions that are state sponsors of terrorism. This would be, in essence, a hook on which a human rights movement could build a divestiture movement against North Korea, like the one that put so much effective pressure on South Africa when I was a much younger man. So. Uh, what all of this leads to is that when Pyongyang reads these reports each year and sees its conduct ignored, it creates an impression of impunity. Indeed, there appears to be a pattern by the State Department of willful blindness toward North Korea's misconduct. The State Department continues to say each year that North Korea is not known to have sponsored any terrorist attacks since the bombing of, Korean, of a Korean Airlines flight in 1987. This statement can no longer withstand factual scrutiny. North Korea has, in fact, repeatedly sponsored acts of international terrorism and should be restored to the list accordingly. Thank you. I would like now to invite uh, our two discussants today to join us on stage. Um, I will have to apologize uh, to two of the distinguished participants tonight, my predecessor, Chuck Downs, former executive director of HRNK, whom I did not acknowledge in my initial remarks, and also Jack Rendler, a founding uh, board member of HRNK, former member of the board. Very happy you're here with us tonight. Um, about this moment right now, we are still um, a, a fairly uh, um, needy human rights organization were unable to afford wireless lavalier mics, so we had to go with the wired. There is no way to avoid the slight awkwardness of the moment. Uh, but um, I should be ready to join the panel in just a second. An uh, extraordinary privilege to have uh, two most distinguished uh, experts, uh, Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt and Dr. Marcus Noland, be our discussants tonight. They're both members of HRNK's board, uh, very active members of the board who uh, continue to play a very important role in um, identifying new ideas and also in the process of drafting and reviewing the reports that HRNK has been producing. 
Uh, Dr. Eberstadt is uh, Henry Wang Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute, where he specializes in demographics, foreign aid, poverty, Korea, East Asia, Russia, and other former Soviet republics. And he is also the author of several titles on uh, very well-known titles on Korea, Korea's Future and the Great Powers, um, Korea Approaches Reunification. Um, I am going to go ahead and introduce our other discussant as well, Dr. Marcus Nolan, who is Vice President and Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute, um, a former Senior Economist at the Council of Economic Advisors in the Executive Office of the President of the United States, also author of uh, many uh, well-known titles, Avoiding the Apocalypse, The Future of the Two Koreas, uh, Korea After Kim Jong-il, and Famine in North Korea, Markets, Aid, and Reform. Nick, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, it makes me both happy and proud to be here with you this evening. It makes me happy to see uh, so many friends, some uh, founding board members of HRNK, like our one-time executive director, Chuck Downs, like Jack Rendler, like Helen Louise Hunter, of course, like uh, the indispensable Suzanne Schulte. Uh, it also makes me happy to be sharing a stage with uh, you, Greg. That was a magnificent uh, op-ed you did in the Washington Post on North Korean human rights today. Kudos on that. Happy, of course, to be sharing the podium with Mark and with Josh, who uh, respectively write two of the absolute go-to blogs for anybody who wants to try to keep themselves smart about DPRK affairs. Um, what makes me proud is the quality of the work, the caliber of the work that HRNK consistently manages to do on uh, what, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, is a very limited budget. And the latest report, of course, in this strong tradition of extremely high caliber research reports is Josh's. Um, I'll try to be very brief about this. Um, the North Korean government's conduct uh, towards uh, human beings both within its uh, territories and outside uh, is understood not because the North Korean government is naughty, and it's not understood because the North Korean government is immoral. The North Korean government is animated by a very uh, clear, coherent, and logical moral code. It's just that this moral code is uh, totally deformed uh, and um, and at odds with, uh, I think, what we describe as being the understanding of natural law in the, uh, in the civilized world. Um, the essence of the North Korean state's uh, moral uh, compass is that uh, the DPRK is the one and only legitimate state in the universe that the royal family and the royal court in Pyongyang are the only uh, people in the universe who matter, and that all other states and all other peoples, and I'm using peoples in the sense of races or minjok, um, but also all of the other population beneath the control of the uh, royal family and the royal court um, count for nothing and can be dealt with in any way that the powers in Pyongyang uh, deem to be uh, expedient or necessary. And of course that some of these uh, human beings that we're describing actually have a value of less than zero. Their live value is less than zero. It's, the world would be better without them. And so if we, 
If we understand this as being the moral compass by which the DPRK sets its behavioral course, we can see that there's a sort of a 360 degree azimuth of abhorrent or vile behavior that the North Korean government regularly and routinely and usually unapologetically uh, conducts. And you know, it's uh, uh, how do I count the ways? Um, it's, it, we'll just list a few which just came to mind. Okay, so there are the prison camps we've already discussed. There's the abduction. Uh, there's the kidnapping and uh, extraction of foreign nationals. There's the wet work and the assassination of uh, individuals abroad. There's the WMD proliferation. There was the Sony hack that Josh mentioned. Uh, there's uh, the threatening of uh, uh, institutions of the press like Shosun Ilbo and its staff uh, with uh, death and destruction. Uh, there's the shelling of civilians on uh, South Korean territory. Uh, there are threats that uh, cities in the United States would be incinerated. Uh, there's, uh, of course, uh, who can ever forget the, uh, the sea of fire threat against, uh, against uh, the city of Seoul by North Korean negotiators. And it's a threat which has been, uh, which has, uh, been brought out as a sort of a greatest hit, which we hear again and again. Um, so all of these are uh, inhuman actions of a government against human beings. And Josh's paper, I think one of the great virtues of it, is um, helping us to think more clearly about which of these um, almost infinite number of uh, transgressions should be understood as acts of terrorism and which should be treated in a different sort of category. Now, um, I find entirely persuasive in this paper the, uh, the evidence that the DPRK, since delisting, has been supporting uh, terrorist organizations overseas. Okay, uh, we don't need to make, I believe, the case much further than uh, the words Hezbollah and Hamas to understand North Korea is indeed a state sponsor of terrorism today, more or less, as we're sitting here this evening. But there are many other um, uh, inhuman acts that the North Korean government uh, commits on a re relatively routine basis that may not quite so easily qualify as terrorism. And I think that one of the signal virtues of this report is not only assembling and rigorously an analyzing uh, whole categories of such behavior, but also helping us to think through what qualifies in legal terms as terrorism and what does not, what should qualify as terrorism, but does not under existing uh, framework of American or international law. Uh, this is a tremendous, uh, I think this is a tremendous step forward, this report. I think it's going to be widely discussed, um, and I certainly hope so. And uh, Josh, uh, congratulations to you once again. Well, it is an honor to be asked to participate in this evening's event uh, as the last man, at least metaphorically, standing between this crowd and the bar. I will uh, <clears throat> try to keep my remarks short. I was recently at a, a function in Seoul, and the host urged me to preach, not to teach. And um, I thought with uh, sharing uh, these responsibilities uh, tonight with uh, Nick Eberstadt, Nick would take care of the preaching, uh, which would allow me to slink back into my more natural role as a didact. So what I'd like to do is sort of go through why I think, and I'll try to be brief about this, why I think this is such an important report. I mean, let me first say I am not a lawyer. I'm not a recovering lawyer. I am not a lawyer wannabe. Um, 
so I may be uniquely unqualified to comment on this report, so please indulge me my uh, educated layman's reactions to it. I think this report is really remarkable and indeed unprecedented in that it combines a meticulous examination of the law with a comprehensive review and assessment of North Korean behavior. And it really is unprecedented and unique in combining these two characteristics. And as a consequence, I think this report, uh, Arsenal of Terror, will be the standard reference on this uh, issue for as many years as we have to discuss the issue. Now, anyone who knows Josh Stanton knows that he has very strong views on North Korea. And I've always said that the reality of North Korea is uh, so bad that there is no reason to exaggerate that uh, one can be highly cautious and conservative in one's assessments and still build a compelling case against the regime in any one of many ways. And what I really like about this report as a board member of HNRK uh, is that it was written by Josh the lawyer, not Josh the blogger. Um, I very much like Josh the blogger, but from the standpoint of being a board member of this organization, I am really pleased that it's the meticulous lawyer who wrote this report. Now, Josh starts with a legal exa examination of legal requirements for designation of a state sponsor of terror and then reviews how that policy has been implemented in practice. And then he lines up North Korean behavior against the criteria established in US law. And when North Korean behavior uh, conforms to these definitions, it's noted, and it is quite an extensive bill of particulars, to say the least. But when some North Korean act, uh, which we may find objectionable, does not probably rise to the uh, legal definition of state sponsor uh, sponsored terrorism as established by the law, the Sony hack case probably being the most prominent example, that is noted too. And the point is, it's not necessary to demonize North Korea. Its behavior over a sustained period of time is, uh, uh, provides ample evidence, uh, uh, more than enough rope uh, to hang them, uh, so to speak. The other thing I like about this report is Josh doesn't stop there. If we examine the, the, the legal definitions of state sponsorship of terrorism and we examine North Korea's behavior, then it's quite clear that North Korea meets those standards. And so he asks the question, why are they not listed? And then he examines uh, behavior of the US government. And this is critical because ultimately we are talking about implementation of US law by the US government. That is not conduct that we need to negotiate with Pyongyang. It does not require their assent or their acquiescence. Rather, the implementation of our own laws is something that can be handled by people who, quite frankly, are all operating within a mile or two of where we're sitting tonight. And Josh doesn't stop there either. He then asks the critical question of how the law itself as well as its implementation might be improved and provides a series of thoughtful policy recommendations. And I would like to uh, focus my remaining remarks on these. The first, he makes three recommendations. The first of these might seem odd to anyone who has never examined US statutes, but it's obvious to anyone who actually has. And that is the need to clarify the definition of international terrorism and support for international terrorism for the purpose of listing a state as a state sponsor of terror. Over time, Congress passes a variety of laws. It amends existing laws. And the result that is, and this is nothing unique to terrorism or unique to North Korea, but in many areas, um, the law can grow like topsy. And it creates all sorts of inadvertent inconsistencies, gaps, and contradictions. And Josh goes through these and helpfully actually provides some draft language that uh, Congress could use to clarify exactly what it means by international terrorism and support for international terrorism. As he noted, emphasizing the unlawful, violent, transnational nature of the activity, its perpetration against non-combatants, to intimidate or coerce the target population, or to alter the policy or conduct of their government. That would be international terrorism. And likewise, support for international terrorism, he provides draft language for this as well, which emphasizes the act of soliciting or directing international terrorist act and providing material support for such an act or the activities of a designated foreign terrorist organization. So having, having essentially gotten our thinking clear, 
Then Josh moves in on to implementation, and he makes three recommendations. The first recommendation is to empower the chairs of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee to notify the State Department that they believe that there may be grounds to believe that a foreign government is in support of international terrorism and then require the State Department to determine if, in fact, the activity constitutes support for international terrorism and the country's designation as a state sponsor of, of international terrorism. This is to say, create an opportunity for Congress to point at something and require the State Department to respond. So no more of all the ducking and weaving that Josh detailed in his uh, opening remarks. The second recommendation is to create a new category of states threatening international peace, which would uh, address a variety of activities which we may find objectionable, things like the Sony hack, things like the uh, proliferation activities or the military activities uh, that Josh uh, noted in his opening remarks that are not terrorism and should not be labeled support for terrorism. We need to be clear about our own thinking. We need to be clear about the implementation of our own laws. And the third recommendation is to increase the deterrent effect of these laws and policies by strengthening the penalties associated with designation of a state sponsor of terror. These could include encouraging other countries to enact similar sanctions, increasing the financial sanctions against national governments, as well as specific individuals and designated entities associated with designation as, the sta as a state sponsor of terror. In the case of North Korea, designating the Reconnaissance General Bureau as one such entity. And finally, uh, imposing new requirements on securities issuers to disclose investments in states that are designated as states uh, as sponsors of terror in their public filings with the SEC. And again, let me emphasize, these recommendations are particularly apt because they don't require our engagement with Pyongyang. They are things we can do on our own, and we should. In short, um, this report, Arsenal of Terror, um, in it, Josh Stanton has, um, has and, and I'm, I am reminded that we are now in the hockey playoff uh, time, uh, he has completed a remarkable hat trick of analyzing U.S. law, analyzing North Korean behavior, and then finally and critically providing expert guidance on how we might uh, uh, move forward. I recommend this report unreservedly and genuinely hope that it has a major impact uh, on U.S. policy in this arena. Thank you very much for your attention. We now have a little bit of time left for questions. Uh, please remember to keep your questions brief. If possible, please identify yourselves and uh, your affiliation. And if possible, please uh, specify to whom you are directing the respective question. We will go to Peter Humphrey first. Peter, if you could please wait for the mic. Uh, Peter Humphrey, I'm a former diplomat and current analyst. Uh, Josh, I wrote a letter to the uh, State Department asking them to sanction individuals, actual torturers, uh, who appear in the North Korean database, uh, which is a collection of uh, debriefings. I have yet to receive a response. What are we going to do with a Treasury Department, I wrote them to, and a State Department that refuses to even answer the inquiry to list individuals who are doing these heinous things? You indicated there's only 70. There probably should be 700. Uh, my answer is pass H.R. 757, the North Korea Sanctions Enforcement Act. Under that legislation, the State Department would be required uh, to come up with a list of the names of people who are responsible for crimes against humanity in North Korea under Section 104 of that, uh, 104A of that act those individuals would be subject to mandatory sanctions. Their assets that flow through the United States financial system would be blocked. Now, you may wonder, as I did not long ago, why would any of these people have assets flowing through the U.S. financial system? The answer is the dollar is the world's reserve currency. Uh, even the North Koreans continue to depend on the dollar system for their financial transactions, and we have, in fact, 
seen sanctions like this have been extremely effective against Russia, against Iran, and against North Korea when applied. Um, the, uh, if you are a North Korean official who wants to move money from a bank in China to a bank in the Cayman Islands or even in Pyongyang, the odds are that that money will actually have to move through two correspondent accounts with U.S. financial institutions likely to be located physically in Manhattan. The Treasury Department has the power to regulate and block those assets. That by itself would be one, of, uh, one way to begin to shift the balance of power in North Korea against the oppressors and in favor of the people of North Korea. We'll go to Ralph Winnie next, and then to Claire Hubbard. Ralph, could you please wait for the mic? talk about um, people that are traveling to North Korea for tourism and, and uh, recreation and leisure. You see, there seem to be flights out of New York every couple weeks with Americans that are going over. The ja Japanese are going over there frequently. You've got people from uh, Eastern Europe, former Soviet bloc republic, from China. Um, so they're, they have set up this sort of um, tourism kind of zone where they are trying to bring in business, and I guess as you pointed out, they, they want the dollar as well. I mean, how, how does the government rationalize that? How do we stop people from going over um, and really supporting the North Korean e economy if they're really not going to make the changes necessary to improve the quality of life for their people? Well, um, the president actually does not have the immediate and direct power to sanction transactions that are uh, incident to travel. Um, that's a cutout, a reservation in the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. So if Congress were inclined to do that, it would have to pass special legislation in order to do that. I think there has been some discussion of maybe putting a section like that into the Senate version of the North Korea Sanctions Enforcement Act, but I don't know what the final product will look like coming out of there. go to Claire Hubbard of KEI next, and then to Dennis Halpin. Hi, I'm Claire Hubbard with the Korea Economic Institute. I was wondering if you could talk about the reasoning behind the US government not placing North Korea on the State Terrorism Act, or State Terrorism List. Is it because of negotiations for nonproliferation or n nuclear negotiations? If you could just clarify that. You Thank know, you. I, I think the three hardest words for anyone to say in Washington or not, I love you, but I don't know. And so I'm going to say that I really don't know, and every year it becomes more difficult for me to psychoanalyze a State Department that is, after all, willing to, to impose sanctions on all of Vladimir Putin's closest lieutenants, but is nonetheless very concerned about upsetting Kim Jong-un, no matter how brazen his conduct, no matter uh, how closely it comes to the cineplexes in your neighborhood, no matter how much it impacts our own freedom to express uh, ourselves, there just seems to be uh, a sense that North Korea is immune to the consequences of its conduct. I really don't understand it. We'll go to Dennis Halpin next. Uh, thank you, Josh, for your presentation, especially your comments about uh, Reverend Kim Dong-shik, and I had read on your blog a few weeks ago about the settlement, but it caused me a bit of concern because I read the settlement was for his son and brother. So I was concerned about Mrs. Esther Kim. I first met her in 2002 in a library in suburban Chicago at, in December when I was back visiting my family because Chairman Hyde had told me to find out what was going on. And I last saw her when she came to Washington, November 2007. She was invited then by the Japanese abductee families, and she had hoped to join their meeting with the State Department. However, the State Department disinvited her, which caused everyone a shock because she was the only American citizen 
the uh, Japanese visitors were not. Even they were shocked. So she met with Ms. Ross Layton and gave her a letter for the State Department and for Ambassador Hill, which then Glenn Kessler reported in 2008 this letter was lost by the State Department. But anyway, she had a very hard time. She was very sick. Uh, I called a couple years ago and heard she was a ho in a hospice, so I was wondering, does the fact that she wasn't mentioned in the settlement mean she's passed away? Do you I, know? I, I surely hope not, and I don't know the answer to that. And I uh, know how to find her lawyer, because he was the one who told me about the settlement. He saw my blog, some of my prior blog posts on the topic, um, and, you know, it was only this week that I found out that she was very sick, and so I had intended to reach out and find out from the attorney whether uh, he knows if she's still alive. One small point of correction, it, the $330 million was not a settlement. It was a judgment. It, the North Koreans have never made an appearance in any of these courts. These are all judgments by default. So this is notwithstanding whatever North Korea's position may be, they are liable to pay that money. Now, uh, the, uh, the Israel Law Center that represented the, the, the plaintiffs is going to have to find some assets to block, levy, and collect. And that's always the harder part. The last question will go to George Hutchinson. Thank you. Uh, very intriguing. And uh, one of the more intriguing aspects, I think, of the report is uh, the delineation made between the unprovoked conventional military attacks and, and terrorist attacks. And I think you did a great job. And I think some would go, whoa, but wouldn't you consider? But then you stop and you go, well, what are we, what are we trying to achieve here? And I think you did a great job of that. But my question is, you know, where do you draw the line between, even though it's a conventional arms against conventional arms, where do you draw the line between a con an unprovoked conventional attack uh, against a military target in South Korea? And then secondly, moving forward, have you surveyed or assessed or forecasted where the North Koreans may be headed with uh, terrorist activities? So I'll answer those questions in inverse order. Um, I try to stay out of the business of predicting just how rash and how dangerous the North Koreans will be, but I would suggest that North Korea's, the leaders of North Korea, at least until very recently, when they have taken on a more impulsive direction, have not historically been irrational. Uh, you see from the report that there is a pattern, the spasm in the 70s of terrorist attacks, then no response, then escalating terrorist attacks in the 80s, then they're listed as a sponsor and things get quiet right up until about 2007, 2008. Some clandestine supplies of arms, but not too much going on. And then when they were lifted from the list, there is this acceleration on the part of the North Koreans. It causes me to think that how North Korea reacts depends on whether someone in our government sends a signal of accountability by imposing tougher sanctions uh, by doing something to perhaps challenge the North Korean re regime in the eyes of its own people by increasing this subversive engagement to the North Korean population. I think that is really one of the hidden deterrents that we have yet to fully explore is to challenge the regime in the eyes of its own people. Uh, as for the line drawing, uh, I would only say that many lawyers have struggled with what you define as terrorism, I think there are examples uh, you could cite like Kobar Towers or even the Pentagon attack, where you could say on the one hand, there were attacks against military targets, but that those soldiers were not on duty in a combat mission at the time, and therefore we classify those as terrorist attacks. Um, so it's, it's close. I think I could make an argument, perhaps, for the Chonan incident. But as a prosecutor, I learned to lead with my strong arguments and not water them down with weaker arguments. So if something is in the gray zone, uh, it's sort of like Marcus was saying a moment ago, we don't really need to embellish anything. The evidence that's strong by itself is strong enough. So I'll leave it to others to draw the line. 
Nick and Mark, would you like to add to Josh's comments or perhaps make a closing statement? Just one additional observation. The, uh, the North Korean government is on record as saying that it opposes terrorism because the leading terrorist state in the world is the United States of America. There you have it. <laughs> a friend of mine's wife is an uh, expert at marketing, and she said that um, at events like this, you should always say the name of the book three times. And I managed to work in twice, so one last time, Arsenal of Terror, it is, it is clearly the best thing written on this topic, and I urge you all wholeheartedly to uh, read this report carefully. Uh, you can get it for free off the website, so you can give it to your congressmen, you can give it to your neighbors, you can assign it to your children to read. Um, um, ma make maximum use of uh, this truly uh, wonderful and frankly unprecedented report. Well, Dr. Nolan and Dr. Eberstadt, thank you very much for your uh, support, for all of the hard work you have put into the production of this report. It continues to be a great honor and a privilege to be on your team. I continue to thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our staff members, Rosa Park, uh, Amanda Mortuado, Raymond Ha, our intern team. They have been working very hard for the past few weeks and months to uh, publish this report and to make this event happen. Uh, we are very grateful that you joined us tonight. Uh, certainly, we are very grateful to Josh for the, all of the work he has put into this uh, landmark report. And most importantly, we look forward to continuing to work with Josh on his next HRNK report because I promise you there will be more Josh Stanton reports published by HRNK. Following the event, we'll have a reception. Some light hors d'oeuvre will be served. Unfortunately, the, ca the, the bar is a cash bar. We're not doing that well yet. That said, please join me in thanking our panelists tonight.